All right, well, good morning, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. I am Kimberly Powell, and I am the Chief of Internship and Fellowship Programs. And I have to tell you one of the most important things we do at the library in terms of celebrating those who are participating in important programs like these is really pausing to take a moment to reflect on experiences and hearing from the participants themselves. So I'd like to welcome each of you to the reflection program for the Librarians in Residence 2019. We are thrilled that each of you, our guests, chose to be with us this morning. So I remember it like it was yesterday. We were just chatting. Um, it was only July, a beautiful day in July, in the lovely Library Services Conference Room, where we went around and just had an orientation, getting to know each other. And here we are in December. It's just gone by so quickly. Since then, many of us in this room have experienced what I've experienced and learned that our six residents are bright, talented, curious, and generous colleagues. And these are exciting times at the library, and residents, you have truly been a part of that in helping us to meet our mission. We hope that your time here with us has been meaningful, gratifying, thought-provoking, and yes, a time of profound growth. We hope that you have a better grasp of the rich access, the rich resources here at the library, how they're organized, how we make them accessible to the public, and we hope that you've connected with our staff, who are also talented and committed to your professional growth and development. My sincere thanks and appreciation to all of the administrative professionals, service unit points of contact, human capital staff, supervisors, tour guides, mentors, and other colleagues for your tireless, tireless efforts to support our residents over the last six months. It's been our great pleasure to work with and learn with each of you. And as I wrap up my remarks, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our next speaker to provide opening remarks, and that would be our principal deputy librarian, Mr. Mark Sweeney. Please help me. Thank you, Thank you so much, Mark. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here with you, and um, I want to congratulate you on completing the Librarians in Residence program. And yeah, today we're gathered uh, to reflect back on your residency, um, both for you and what it means for the Library of Congress. So LIR, Library in Residence Program, it's designed to develop the next generation of librarians and information professionals. This program allows us to train and mentor early on uh, career librarians while building uh, bridges between the library and the graduate programs that you came from. So that's be beneficial to all of us. And um, I want to just stop there for a second and just talk a little bit about um, uh, the program in general. You, you know, this is a, it's a relatively new program here at the library. This is concluding the second round of this. And um, it is a special interest of Dr. Hayden as a librarian of Congress. It's a special interest of mine as well. And I know that LC um, s and management is, um, is really focused on it as, as well. Um, I'm glad to see that it's expanded over its first year and it continues to be refined as a program. And on a real personal note, um, back in 1990 and 1991, I was part of the second to last class here at the library for an intern program for newly um, graduated library and information science students. And um, I, was, I was sorry to see that program I went by the wayside. It, uh, it was a different program in that day. But uh, it was a, good, a great opportunity for people who were just beginning their career to learn more about what the library was all about um, in areas where we were cutting edge and maybe areas where we weren't so cutting edge. And I know as part of that class, it, uh, I learned a tremendous amount from um, my colleagues in that intern program, um, and I'm glad to see that we can bring a little bit of that back, but in a different way here for the library, because there's a real sea change in terms of leadership um, here at the library, and uh, I think this is one way for us to um, enrich um, what we have here. So um, while you fulfilled your job responsibilities as professional librarians and learned a lot about the library, um, you generously shared um, with us your knowledge and perspective coming out of library school. 
We hope that the program's experiential learning and enrichment activities and internship, uh, um, international, inter intentional mentorship provided ample opportunities for you to flourish as you grow in the, in the profession. We're proud to call you colleagues and uh, we have appreciated this opportunity to host your residency. And I wanna thank you personally for choosing the Library of Congress. As a second cohort of the Librarians in Residence program, you're now part of a legacy, legacy, two years running, of newly minted librarians who can say that they've had an opportunity to contribute to the mission of the library. And you're also now well equipped to be ambassadors uh, and we'll be counting on you, um, each one of you, to stay engaged with the library um, beyond just today. I wanna echo um, Kimberly's remarks in saying I wanna thank the IFP team. Um, it's incredibly important that we grow this program. I really appreciate the way you've taken responsibility for it and then also all of the, uh, the supervisors that um, worked so closely with um, our LIRs this year. I, there's countless other people but I think, I think you've, you, uh, you covered it well. So our ultimate aim uh, was to bolster your potential for securing a permanent job. Um, whether it's here at the Library of Congress or elsewhere. So um, we're eager to hear your voices as um, you reflect upon your time here at the library. Um, our first speaker is uh, Lauren Baker, who worked with Trevor Owens uh, at the uh, Digital Content Management section of the Digital Collections and Management and Services Division in uh, Library Services. Um, so I will turn it on over and looking forward to hearing your reflections. Thanks so much. Good morning. My name is Lauren Baker. I'm a librarian in residence on the web archiving team. Since 2000, the web archiving program has preserved web content selected by subject specialists around the library. The program aims to make web content available to researchers now and in the future. The great opportunity of digital libraries is to make information discoverable. While in residence, I worked on a project to do just that creating framework for collections of web archives. Framework is a page on the library's website that acts as an entry point to a digital collection. It includes a narrative about the collection's scope, a rights statement, some featured items from the collection, and links to expert resources. The aims of the framework project were to create a better user experience and make it easier to browse the web archives. Before the project began, 33 web archive collections had framework on the website, but there was a backlog of archives in need of description. In addition, earlier this month, through the incredible work of the web archiving team, the library's digital content management section released more than 4,000 web archives. Many of these were part of new collections and required description as well. To create framework for both the backlog and new collections, I collaborated with more than 10 different divisions in library services and the law library, as well as the IT design and development team. The project offered an opportunity to consider how to better describe the web archives. We were able to harness information available from the nomination and capture processes, as well as from the archives themselves. We provided users with more information, created greater consistency across collections, and enabled better search. Taking cues from our colleagues around the library and in the larger web archiving community, there are five areas where we've enriched the collection descriptions. The first is frequency of collection, how often the sites were crawled. This gives users information about the depth of content that they can expect. The second field we added is languages, which puts the web archive descriptions more in line with archival finding aids. Languages that the content is in may be a determining factor for a researcher considering whether to use a collection. The third added field is acquisition information. We now include a statement for collections that are ongoing to indicate that sites continue to be added. This can help researchers understand why there may be earlier information for some sites than others. Behind the scenes, we've added subject tags to help with search. The two graphs shown here list 13 broad topics used to describe all digital collections and how they can be applied to the web archives at the beginning and end of the framework project. 
In the upper graph before the project, nine of the 13 topics could be applied to the web archives. In the lower graph after the project, all 13 topics are represented. Not only did we make more collections available, but those collections were on a greater diversity of subjects. Finally, we've placed greater emphasis on linking to expert resources, because the more linking, the better in terms of search and discoverability. Perhaps most exciting about the expert resources is for the first time, the web archives are interconnecting with each other. Two newly added collections, the American Music Creators and American Music Industry Web Archives offer examples. As the library continues to add to the web archives, many more connections like these will be possible. Through the project, we created framework for 29 collections, nearly doubling the number accessible to users. For the first time, there are collections on LGBTQ plus studies, veterans history, composers, authors, American business, economics, food and foodways, zines, and many more themes and events. The project has set the stage for regular creation of framework as new web archives are made available. I'm grateful to have had the chance to work with the web archiving team on improving access to collections. To be in residence at the library has meant dedicated time and space for discovery. I hope the same for our users. There are boundless stories in the web archives ready to be discovered. Thank you. Hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Anastasia Binkowski. I go by Tasha, and I am the librarian in residence in Rare Book and Special Collections. Uh, when I applied to this program, I had only been to DC on school field trips, uh, but I knew that I was graduating from library school at Simmons University with a lot more that I wanted to explore, um, and I couldn't think of a better place to start my professional career than the Library of Congress. To that end, my number one goal has been making the most of my time here. Uh, on the one hand, it's easy to sum up where the time has gone. <laughs> Four days a week, I'm in the rare book reading room, and Wednesdays, famously Tasha Wednesdays, I'm in the manuscript reading room. You'll also notice a small sliver on this part chart. Uh, that's the week I got to spend in the literature section of cataloging. They don't tell you this, but it only takes a week to learn everything. On the other hand, looking back, I'm surprised and delighted by all that my fellows, and, er, my fellows and I have been able to do in just six months. I have attended classes, taken tours, led tours, answered questions from patrons all over the world, created, co-created, and edited libguides, uh, and worked to process archival collections. Not everything fits on this slide, of course. Uh, I thought this was already overloaded enough to make my point, which is that we've been busy and we've accomplished a lot. Uh, so with my remaining time, I'm going to focus on a single project that I was able to see through from start to finish, the Early American Paper Money Collection. The collection consists of over 200 bills dated between 1746 and 1865, issued mainly by the Continental Congress and the 13 original colonies, later states, plus some outliers. Um, these are all examples from our collections, with the top left and middle being the earliest and latest examples. I rehoused and reorganized all 200 plus bills by issuing body, um, a blanket term to include colony, state, Congress, banks, etc. cetera. Uh, I subarranged by date and further arranged by denomination. Most of my time and energy went into recording item level detail for the finding aid, um, such as serial numbers and signatures wherever I could read them and printer's information as printed, um, and also occasional notes on condition. So for comparison, here is a modern $1 bill next to $1 bills from Maryland in 1774, Massachusetts in 1780, and a continental currency $1 bill from 1776. On the right is the same continental currency um, showing the backs. You can see how different they are in size, color, printing, paper, um, and I hope that the finding aid will make this collection more visible and useful to researchers who can tell us even more. 
Through working with, with this collection, I also had the opportunity to write for the Science, Technology, and Business blog, Inside Adams, to highlight some big names from American history that are tied to this collection material, including John Hart and Benjamin Franklin. Uh, one name that didn't make it into my post, but I'm guessing will be familiar to all of you, is Paul Revere. Where the previous slide highlighted differences between modern and early paper money in America, here I want to focus on a similarity, the problem of counterfeiting. Counterfeiting of these bills was rampant from the start. Most common were attempts to change the denomination by adding a zero or changing one number to another. Uh, some bills even have a printed warning reading, to counterfeit is death. And it's true, they hanged men that were found guilty of this crime. What came out of combating this problem was a variety of creative design elements, including, of course, images. Uh, I wrote about the nature printing technique invented by Benjamin Franklin for the Inside Adams blog post, but before scholars had cracked uh, Franklin's method, it was assumed to be engraving. What Paul Revere was doing for bills in Massachusetts in 1779 was actually engraving. This famous portrait of Revere even includes his engraving tools on the table there in front of him. Uh, so my Awareness of this counterfeiting issue led me to be skeptical of many of the bills in this collection, including this one. This rising sun did not match the one in my reference books, and I was excited that we might have a fake. I did more research and discovered photos of bills um, from the collection of the American Numismatic Society. There I found many different rising suns. Here the hills are on the other side. Here there's a pine tree in the foreground. And on this one, the sun has a face. So what's going on here? They can't all be fakes. In fact, this too is an attempt to catch counterfeiters. So each sun corresponds to a different denomination that was printed by Massachusetts in this year, um, making it impossible to alter just the value of the bill and easier to check the authenticity. So our four shillings and six pence bill, rising sun, matches up exactly to this four, sec or four shillings, six pence bill from the American Numismatic Society. So it's likely authentic after all. It's clear to me that Paul Revere was one step away from adding a pair of sungla sunglasses to the face of that sun. So I'll leave you here with a question. Did Paul Revere invent the first meme of the colonies? <laughs> and finally, before I get yanked off stage, let me add a special thank you to everyone who's made me feel welcome here from the start, who has encouraged and supported my professional development and answered any number of my thousands of questions. Thank you. Hello. Um, we all wore black in solidarity today, and uh, now I feel like I should have worn blue jeans and like talked about iPhones for an hour, but <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, I'm Zachary Myrana. Uh, I am the Collection Preservation Librarian in Residence. Um, I come from University of Illinois, where I graduated this year, and now I work in the Binding and Collection Care Division and the Preservation Reform Writing Division. Okay, so I think that with any temporary role like this it requires some soul searching at the beginning to figure out where you fit in the organization and how your sort of role will be um, performed throughout the time here. Um, I was lucky to sort of balance process oriented tasks, the kind of day to day stuff, um, the things that sort of keep business running, but also teach me the technical or infrastructure of the organization and the systems that we use as a unit versus the sort of larger policy tasks that are these months long efforts to um, affect how the directorate does its business. So I'll talk a little bit about a few of these process-oriented tasks, such as recovering data from tangible media using digital forensics hardware and software, such as Fred, um, our PRD's digital forensics system. Um, he also has a little brother about this big named Fernando. Um, also tasks like accounting, quality control, and adjusting catalog records to help keep business moving here. That's contrasted with these larger sort of policy projects I've been working on, such as writing a white paper to argue for an automated way to allow patrons to prioritize materials to be digitally reformatted. So I looked at other academic institutions, other libraries, how they empower users to select materials for digitization per their needs, um, rather than the libraries or in tandem with the libraries. Um, and that was sort of a really invigorating way to see how um, preservation can sort of be connected to the patron experience. Um, also, I developed a policy and standard practices to limit collection care treatment on materials that have already been digitized here at the LC. Uh, so really looking for um, these items that already have digital surrogates made of them and making sure that we are paying more attention to the sort of last copy and rare items that exist in the general collection. 
Um, in addition to that, a mapping and survey project for collection spaces on the Capitol Hill campus was another big project. And I want to delve a little bit deeper into this final project that I mentioned. Uh, this was a project to um, map space and emergency management issues in the stacks. And this is all sort of a work in progress. So some of these things might change. Um, but this was essentially a way to introduce a more data-driven approach to space management. Um, this photo, for example, shows a contained leak occurring just a few feet away from items that are stored on the floor due to overcrowding. So you can see that a lot of these issues are working in tandem with each other. Being able to visualize that, that using a map and a high-level survey will go a long way to informing how we sort of um, direct our treatment and target our efforts to preserve things. Uh, so in doing that, we can sort of map these uh, issues to better target our efforts. Um, a few more sort of issues that we're tracking here, uh, environmental issues such as corroded sprinklers. You can see the sort of green corrosion on the sprinkler head there, indicating that it needs to be replaced. Um, space issues such as items that are stored on the floor or empty space on the shelves um, are also big issues for us. A few of the data points that we're looking at here include content issues like oversized materials and cereals, environmental risks like corroded sprinklers, condition issues such as damaged items, and space issues, including those items on the floor or the empty space um, that we see quite a lot in the stacks. Um, that's all with sort of the goals to improve our current maps that we have with new information and to carry out this high-level survey. Uh, that entails developing tools to carry out the survey itself of all Capitol Hill collections. And we're looking here at the section level, so not the item level. We're looking at the sort of every upright bookcase, um, of which there are about 95,000 sections and uh, the Adams and Jefferson buildings alone. So you can see that this is a, this is a massive project. It's gigantic, and it's going to last forever, which is great. And um, <laughs> at first, we're going to have a pilot in 2020 to sort of test things out and make sure that we've got the right um, data points to track. And after that, we'd like to continue doing sort of perennial data collection every two years um, to keep data current, all with the goal to um, use that data to inform our policies. So with that sort of shallow dive into what I've done so far, um, I'd like to thank the amazing sort of mentors and collaborators I've had here. Um, it's really been a fabulous experience this past six months. So thank you very much. My name is Samantha Wad, and I'm the librarian in resident for the Hispanic Division. Before coming to the Library of Congress, I graduated at the University of North Carolina with a Master in Library Science and a Certificate in Archives and Records Management. Even before starting my graduate degree, I wanted to work at the Library of Congress. It seemed like the greatest place to work, and at the very least, I wanted to find out if there actually is a staircase behind the desk in the main reading room, as shown in the National Treasure movie. Now, six months later, I can honestly say that there is a staircase back there, and the library is the best place to work. My first and main project that I worked on as a resident was creating a libguide for the online version of the handbook. The main purpose of this guide is to teach users, both new and experienced, how to search for resources using the handbook. The Handbook of Latin American Studies, or HLAS, is a selective annotated bibliography of scholarly books, journal articles, conference proceedings and papers, book chapters, maps and atlases, and electronic journals dealing with Latin America. The online version of the handbook includes a searchable catalog of the resources listed in the handbook and a link to them in the library catalog. The guide that I created includes general searching tips, tips for beginners and for experienced users, and other resources for finding materials and resources in HLAS and the Hispanic Division. I had the opportunity to work with the handbook as a researcher and then as a librarian and believe that this has helped me to create a clear and easy to follow guide that helps answers the most common questions. In the future, we hope that an interactive video will be added to the guide to help users to navigate HLAS and teach them other searching tips. Another project that I personally propose and manage at the library is the J.I. Kislak Collection Guide with fellow resident Tasha Binkowski. We wanted to create a guide that would help curate material in the Kislak Collection from the library's website and additional resources from other organizations connected with Kislak. We wanted to tie in information from all the divisions who have a hand in, collect in the collection and give researchers a landing page to go to to find resources and materials in the collection. This guide includes information about selected materials found in different divisions, as well as resources, digitized material, and even a page dedicated to young readers, including classroom activities. 
This project has been one of the most difficult and rewarding to work on. Because this collection spans so many divisions, it was interesting to work with a number of different LC staff to learn about their role in the collection and highlight every division's work in maintaining it. We hope that this guide will provide a lot of resource assistance to a number of researchers and patrons, as well as highlight the significance of this collection. Other projects that I've completed at the library has been created a Spain country guide for the Hispanic division that directs researchers to Spanish material in the general and international collection. I also created an interactive map that depicts the international scope of contributing editors who are involved in reviewing materials for the handbook. I wrote a blog post for the Four Corners blog summarizing my time here at the library, speaking of my projects, and including information on the amazing material I have seen here, including, but not limited to, pieces of Thomas Jefferson's hair, the Declaration of Independence, and the director's cut of the classic blockbuster film, the Justin Bieber Never Say Never movie. I also learned about the handbook selection process and contributed to HLAS book runs, visiting different divisions in the library to sort through possible resources to be sent to contributing editors. I also got to work with other Hispanic division staff to help with displays in the Hispanic division and worked reference shifts, helping patrons in person and over the phone. I thoroughly enjoyed my time here at the library as a resident and would like to take my remaining time to thank a number of people who have helped me along the way. I would like to thank Linda and Kimberly with organizing events for myself and for the other residents and helping us whenever we needed it. I would like to thank everyone in the Hispanic division who helped me and welcomed me with open arms. Everyone in the division is wonderful, kind, smart, and warm. I would also like to thank my mentor Hector for meeting with me every week, answering all my questions, setting up tours for me, and being very supportive. Thank you to all my fellow residences for being great coworkers, collaborators, and above all, friends. And lastly and most importantly, I would like to thank my supervisor, Suzanne. Thank you for teaching me, guiding me, helping me, and supporting me. I could not have asked for a better supervisor, and I loved every minute of working for you. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Cambell. Um, as the 2019 Librarian in Residence in the US Anglo Division, I have worked with dedicated colleagues to grow the national collection at the Library of Congress. Although often behind the scenes, the area of acquisitions and bibliographic access is an exciting and vibrant area in which to practice librarianship, an area where value, rights, and accessibility are perpetually negotiated and rationalized, and it is critical to the mission of the library. Within the US Anglo Division, I completed two-month work rotations in three sections, encompassing a wide variety of acquisitions-related duties, methods, formats, and content. To ensure that the Library of Congress has a representative sample of features, featured creators' works from the 2019 National Book Festival, I began my residency in the US monograph section by completing firm order acquisitions of print materials. From July to August, I completed pre-order work, bibliographic verification, ordering and receiving in time for the festival on August 31st. Aiming for timeliness, cost effectiveness and accurate record keeping, I performed the kind of analysis needed for acquisitions work at large. This project also made my attendance at the National Book Festival more meaningful this year, as I was able to see many of the authors in person whose books I had acquired. Acquisition staff are not only evaluating material at the item level, but they are also responsive to the changes in the publishing industry in the larger context of digital technology. Nowhere is this clearer than in the digital publishing um, environment that includes issues such as licensing, rights, and automated communication with vendors. While working with the Canada and Oceania section from September to October, I was able to participate in the renewal process for the section's print and electronic serial subscriptions. The US Anglo Division serves as the hub for the ERMS Liaison Group, which manages the access and maintenance of electronic titles through the library's Electronic Resources Open Catalog, or EROC. In addition, I conducted pre-acquisitions work with the CO section that involved investigating rights for freely accessible electronic issues that the library collects in print through a membership subscription. 
The CO section is currently exploring the possibility of acquiring and making accessible serials like this with the digital collections management team. My rotation in the CO section challenged me to think about acquisitions and access for serials in a new digital publishing environment where some publishers provide digital content under a stated open access policy of making research freely available to the public for the greater global exchange of knowledge. For, the, for my third and final rotation, I have been assisting the US Serials and Government Documents section with the State Web Archiving Project, whose purpose is to acquire and preserve digital content of government documents published by American state agencies and territories. Regarding pre-acquisitions work, I researched the library's existing print holdings published by state agencies in the US Virgin Islands, New Mexico, and Louisiana in order to make recommendations of content to recommending officers, to verify content that the web harvester should acquire, and to help provide user access by confirming proper title metadata. In closing, the Librarian in Residence program has given me valuable opportunities to contribute to a wide range of projects related to acquisitions and bibliographic access in the US Anglo Division. I'm also indebted to the members of the IFP team who have arranged engaging enrichment activities for us throughout the program. So many people have helped make my experience in the libra Librarian in Residence program rewarding, both professionally and personally, and I'm grateful to all of them. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. I don't think we've ever said that yet. Um, good morning and welcome to the final presentation for the Librarians in Residence program, class of 2019. I had to say that. Yay us. My name is Emily Spitz and I am the Bibliographic Control Resident at NLS. We would also like to thank Dr. Carla Hayden and Mr. Mark Sweeney for supporting this fabulous, incredible program, the Librarians in Residence program which allows us a glimpse into the very directorates and wonders of the LOC. Whoops. Uh, that doesn't work. Not hooked up. There we go. That All May Read is the mission statement central to the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled, or the NLS. The NLS provides thousands of Braille books and audio materials to over half a million patrons. The NLS here in Washington acts as a hub to support over 100 national network libraries. These network libraries are patron-centered and provide readers advisory and academic support. They organize community outreach programs, technology training, and assists the NLS patrons with special resources, including print braille for the very youngest readers. Uh, I was a bibliographic control or BCS resident at NLS and as a professional musician also contributed my musical expertise to music section projects. In BCS, I handled bibliographic processing, technical services supporting successful network library readers advisory. I formed accurate collection metadata, conducted bibliographic database management, added and edited records, and created an annotated bibliography for NLS Union Catalog subject headings. Accurate bibliographic metadata is a critical element for any library, and especially here at the NLS. With screen reading software such as JAWS, patrons of all abilities access NLS resources. This is an example that shows the catalog search results. NLS patrons hear these same results dictated or translated by a JAWS screen reader. So it's very important that the metadata associated with these records is accurate. I also participated in music projects at the NLS. 
the music section and the recording studio collaborated on the audiobook How to Write Songs with Keyboards by Ricky Rooksby. I posted a blog on the NLS website about the process of creating this audiobook, described the book's contents, and alerted the NLS users that Rooksby's book is for patrons of all musical abilities. The challenge. The challenge of this project. How best to define these keyboard images for print-disabled patrons. This was not easy. Our solution was to create clear narration to describe the graphics and maintain the integrity of the text. Valuable feedback was provided by NLS staff members. They were amazing. The American Folklife Center's Take the Archive Challenge inspired an NLS archive sampler concert. I researched the NLS music archives and found hidden gems to include in this presentation. One hilarious example of musical mayhem was an aria from PDQ Box Oratorio, The Seasonings. Soprano Ann Willis Hill joined me for this lunchtime concert in October. Let me see if I'm going to have to be able to do this. And the frog was from Ogden Nash's The Musical Zoo. It was a featured selection. It's a little bit longer than that, but that's, you'll get a taste. The success of the librarian and residence program would not have been possible without the tire tireless efforts of Linda and Kimberly. And I want to say thank you to them. Before we do anything else, they've been wonderful. Um, Karen Kenninger, head of NLS, was very supportive of this program, as was Jason Yasner, my mentor. Most importantly, my colleagues in BCS, Hien, Jackie, and Anita, have answered my thousands and thousands of questions and most importantly have been very supportive and helpful to me. Thanks again to all of you for your time, energy, and commitment to making this program such a success. And Kimberly and Linda, if you would come up here, we have a special surprise for you. Linda, did you have a little uh, wrap-up yeah. thing? Okay. Thank you. Wow. I wanted to thank our residents again for their interesting, amazingly polished professional presentations and um, for your contributions to the library. Thank you again for coming to the Library of Congress. I also wanted to say that I have learned so much from you over the past six months and appreciate you having the opportunity to be become better acquainted. And um, I also wanted to applaud your generosity to all of your colleagues and to one another. And you really pulled together as a cohort and I was very impressed by that. Um, so we have had a very eventful six months, I think it's fair to say, orchestrating, uh, orchestrated to help you understand the many forms of librarianship as practiced at the library. As a group, you engaged in site visits to each of the divisions sponsoring a resident. And we are grateful for your help in hosting these site visits and sharing your expertise with your cohort and the library staff. Special introductions to operations in other offices shed additional light on the diverse roles played by Library of Congress librarians. We heard from the National Audiovisual Conservation Center in Culpeper, the Law Library, the Copyright Office, the Congressional Research Service, and many others. So we want to thank all those who provided these presentations to our residents. 
your contributions to our monthly lunchtime gatherings were rich and enlightening. These conversations ranged from bib frame to expanding access to collections through technology, from serving the blind and print disabled to serving Congress, from working with general collections to working with special collections. I hope each of these encounters were rewarding for you. And I wish you every success in your future careers. Thank you again. Finally, I'd like to also acknowledge the resident supervisors and mentors without whom the program would not have been possible. Genuinely, thank you very, very much. And congratulations are in order, order all around, so thank you. With that, this is my special pleasure. With that, I invite you to enjoy the refreshments in the lobby so that we might get to know each one another a bit better. Thank you.